You guys, before you greet each other, uh, kids, we would like you to uh, head back in the hallway over there. So greet each other. It's a beautiful day.
Hey, kid. Can you switch the songs? Hosanna? Is that easy or no? Okay. We're going to go Hosanna. Hosanna is next. Good? Okay. He's ready. Mark 11. This is as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he untied the donkey. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road ahead of Jesus while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna meaning save with an exclamation point because it was an exclamation of praise. Hosanna, Jesus, you're here to save us. Praise to the Lord for that. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. So as we, uh, as we put our trust, think about the things you're putting your trust in. There's no better thing you can trust in. With joy in our hearts, by Jesus.
got a couple of announcements for us. My apologies. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you guys. How about this worship? Oh, it just fills my heart, and it just makes it more exciting to tell you about the incredible stuff that is taking place here at Crossroads. want to remind you that we have a bulletin. Every single Sunday we have one of these, and inside this bulletin is all of the cool things that are happening and upcoming. There's uh, also a connected card in the very back that you can tear off. It is perforated. And there's a really cool bulletin that's in there, too. Uh, but it's a place for you to write down your prayer requests. You can keep it confidential, or you can not mark it confidential. Thank you, sir. But we want to be praying for you, for the needs that we have in our congregation. There's such a, a powerful message that comes when you know you're being prayed for. So feel free to fill that out if you just want to... If you're new here, you want us to let us know that you were here. We don't pester you or bother you with anything. We just want to know that you were here and be able to include you in our prayers. So also, uh, I believe next Sunday is a pretty incredible day. Resurrection Sunday is here. All right. Oh, Resurrection Sunday is here. Okay. Sweet up. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to thank you for those of you that have signed up to bring us a dish. We have the sign-up sheet in the back, and we still have a few more spots. But I want to encourage you guys to join us at 915 for our Celebration Fellowship Breakfast. It's going to be awesome. The message, we have Pastor Joe Sturgeon coming from Susanville again to help us out. And following that, we might have a special treat for the young ones in our church. We may have some. Thank you guys so much for your donations to that as well. So we're excited. Look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday. I just have to point out, I love seeing some that others may not call young ones um, celebrated with that. So age isn't about uh, how young you are, right? Young isn't about how your age. Sorry, words. It's good. I am, man. It's been a... I'm going to stop talking. Um... <laughs> So as we, as we go into this last, uh, this last song, uh, oh, come to the altar. You know, a lot of times, and, and these, these altars are, are open for, for prayer, and I, and I just love seeing people come up and, and the community of people around them gathering as well. And we come to the altar, a lot of times it's, it's when we have like our, our deepest concerns or hurts or despair, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but the, the beautiful part about this song is the bridge. I'm just going to read the lyrics of it because I really want you to think about this and pray about this. We can also come to the altar to just praise him. And the joy that comes from telling God who he is and who he is is powerful. And the bridge says this, Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. This is why we come to the altar as well, to praise him. So just bow your hearts before him as we go into this. If your altar is where you're sitting or where you want to kneel or up here at the front, wherever it is, God is calling us no matter our story, no matter our past, because our future is with him and our hope is in him as well. Jesus Christ. 
your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus is calling. Jesus, I, uh, I thank you that when you call, you use our name. You call us by name. We are chosen. We are part of your plan. Not a surprise to your plan. Lord, your plan is, uh, you know, it's like we, we try to imagine our best life. You know, we get our... our, our six-month plan or a five-year plan or ten-year plan and we imagine these goals yet these ambitions these targets lord as great as those may be in our own minds you look at us and you graciously listen and you just kind of nod your head and smile and you say would you believe me if i told you it'd be even better Jesus, I thank you that your plans are better than ours. Your ways are better than ours. May your thoughts be our thoughts. May your words be our words. Jesus, I just I, I pray for uh, each person that, that brings their, their burden, their worry, their anxiety, their stress, whatever it is, Lord, I think we all have that today, big or small. We have that but it's not ours. It's not our, our, our weight to carry. It's not our burden to bear. It's yours. So we just, we, we, we lay it before you because it's not ours to carry. It's just not. And you tell us that it's, you'll take that burden. You'll take that worry, that concern. So we just, we, we let go of those. Help us to let go. Lift up all those that are uh, absent today because of sickness. Pray for Diane and Jim and Lynn. Pray for Larry and Susan also. God, our, our, uh, our bodies always need healing and, and strength and growing. May you be this, this ultimate physician that we go to, the first to treat our hearts, Lord, and to trust you more. We just pray for healing. For all of them. We pray for those that are dealing with the burdens of uh, loss, of those that have, have passed on recently, and I know there's quite a few affected. We just pray for, for Eric Heidman, especially right now as he's recently lost his father. Pray for uh, the Abbots, <clears throat> um, as Brian has recently lost his aunt, and just the, uh, the ripple effects through the families, Lord. It, um, it's, it hurts, and it's, uh, and it's hard. So we pray for um, all those that knew these people and, and we just pray for a celebration of the life that they had and a peace and a comfort in the days to come. Pray also for healing for Tara's mom who's going to be going through uh, breast cancer surgery. Pray for healing for her. Continue healing for Jim with the shoulder surgery and, and all those that are dealing with, with uh, bodies that need repair. Lord, we pray for Crossroads Church. I thank you so much for the people that are here. And it's, it's again, God, I, I believe it's not just to occupy a seat. It's to, to grow and to challenge each other and, and, and to become one solid body with you, Jesus, as the head. We pray for uh, the next pastor. We pray for whoever is, is being called to, to fill this position Pray for their hearts to be open and aware of how great this place is, Lord, as, as you lead us. And I'm so grateful for how you continue to lead us, Lord. I just pray for Russ today as he's prepared this message. May you be the addition or the subtraction or the expansion of whatever that message is, Lord. May your word speak clearly to us, not only today, but as we go about our week. Pray for a hunger and a thirst be completely saturated by your Holy Spirit and to know without question that it's you, God, that are leading us. 
pray for boldness, increased boldness, Lord, to, to stand for the faith, to stand in this belief and this trust that I don't understand what I need to do, how it happened, where I need to go with this, but to wash that away, to wipe it away and say, Jesus, I need to trust you more. And even if I don't know where I'm going, what thing to do next, I trust you because you are God and you are wonderful beyond measure. Lead us on today, Lord. Help us to see uh, more of the sunshine, more of the light that you're shining in our hearts and in our lives. May we also be that light to others. Give us the words. May they just appear out of our mouths that bring hope and joy and love to those around us. Thank you for the body of believers. Bring us together as a community tightly knit by your beautiful bond. Thank you, Jesus, for this day ahead. May we hear you clearly. In your name, amen. All right, Mr. Russ. Children's Church. Thanks. Appreciate that. It's good. Kids have a, have a fun time back there. The people, there we go, the people on the internet can hear us. We're, uh, we're live, by the way. If you're ever not here, I think we finally figured it out several weeks in a row. Um, Mr. Smith is uh, missing today. He's sick, and so he's been texting me about the feed. Yes, it says it is live, but then the feed does not connect. It works now. It was kicking me into admin mode. It works. Don't worry. <laughs> you can see there, there's, this is all this morning. I mean, this is uh, the, starting right there at the green. There's like 10 different messages from him. But, uh... <laughs> oh, he can hear us now. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, in about 30 seconds, he'll hear this. Yeah. <laughs> Get some rest. There we go. Is that better? Straight from your wife's mouth. Get some rest. All right. He's probably, I'm probably going to feel this buzz in <laughs> a minute. <laughs> It's funny. Okay, so um, I, I finally just decided to give up on creating the worship notes like Pastor Bill used to do them and, and how Steve and Jay does them in a, in a little half sheet. I don't know, maybe they can give me a tutorial and <laughs> teach me how to do it. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> he just texted me. I got, it on my, I got a little notification on my watch there. So, yes. Hello, everyone. There we go. I can just be the conduit. He can give the sermon. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, as the title says, gulp. Yeah. So remember a couple weeks ago, several weeks ago, I said, you, you know, we have these exemplars to follow. Now we learn you are the exemplar. Okay. So that was Paul's building up to this moment in chapter 3 of Philippians saying, you're it. Tag. Go. Right? Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, first off, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, as always, I'll summarize it. I won't read the whole thing. It's not me. Don't want it to be me. Uh, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> Guy's kind of pushing me along, saying, let's go do it. So there we go. Um, and then a, a quick note uh, up above in First Corinthians, as I was pasting that, I, I glanced up and this too. Um, Jay and Steve and myself, we are just humble servants. We're not anything special. You know, God is just telling us what the message is from week to week. And so there's, um, there's no confidence in our flesh. There's no confidence in, in us as people. And we truly heard that you're actually staying around to listen. <laughs> you know, that, that this is what God has to say. Uh, to Crossroads, and to the broader community. So uh, I, I saw that verse, and it, it reminded me that um, Christ is not divided. Uh, Paul is not crucified. 
for them, or for us. It was not Paul whose name we were baptized into. It wasn't Jay's name. It wasn't Steve's name. It's not Russ's name. Um, it's, it's Christ, and Christ will bring us um, through whatever this church has to go through for the next few months before we find a pastor, whatever you need to go through for the next few months um, if you're going through a hard time or if you're experiencing great times. Um, then it's something to remember and store up for the future. And so I need to get a tissue real quick. Hold on. This happened to me the first time, and it bugged me the entire time. Sorry. There we go. Okay. All right. Something about the adrenaline, I guess. Okay. Um, so to start, I thought to myself, well, Paul does an interesting thing in Philippians 3. He starts out talking about the flesh, and then he ends up talking about perfection. And so these are some of the things that I do as a teacher. Um, I see a lot of flesh when I'm teaching. Jay, you can, you know, and, and Jennifer, you know, anybody else teachers or retired teachers? Miss? Oh, yeah. yeah. Caden, of course, yes. <laughs> um, and so we see a lot of flesh in the classroom. And so I've, I've d designed a few, like, automatics. Like, these are the things I say, right? So if I see something start to escalate, I'll just, I'll just go, whoa, 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 slow yo bro. And, and it does something to their mind, right? Because they're starting to get angry. Yeah, it just, it just snaps them out of it. They're like, oh, yeah, right? And, and so that's one of the things I've developed over the years. Um, sometimes they'll come in singing rap songs, and I'll say, um, yeah, I don't remember saying that. Or I'll say something like, uh, I didn't say that. Why are you quoting, misquoting me? And so that will start to snap them out because they know they're not supposed to be dropping lyrics in my classroom. That's what I say. Don't be dropping lyrics in my classroom. Uh, and then the bruh. Oh, the bruh. So I decided, okay, I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm just going to say, hey, that's Mr. Bruh Munyon to you. And then I'm not God. They'll hear him say, oh, God, or oh, Jesus. I'm not God, but thank you for the compliment. And then... Uh, Oh, beatboxing. <laughs> so every now and then they'll want uh, music while they're doing their worksheets, like the worksheet in front of you. Um, and I'll say, okay, I'll play you some music. And I'll keep going, even after they say, Mr. Monion, you know what I'm talking about. I say, yeah, I'm playing you music. So there's ways of redirecting our flesh, right? Uh, redirecting others' flesh and redirecting our own. And that's kind of what Paul is getting at here. Uh, I don't have my, my slides up here with me. I forgot to print them. Um, okay, so chapter 1, uh, there we go. I got them right here. Chapter 1 was about Paul's joy. Uh, Paul's joy was about their salvation, and not just their salvation, but their joy. He was rejoicing because they had joy, right? And then not just joy over their salvation. He was rejoicing because they had joy over their salvation, and they had joy in continuing that passing on of their salvation to others. Because once you get it, you want to hand it off, right? And then chapter 2, it was all about seeing in others the models of maturity, the exemplars. And now chapter 3 is about becoming perfect. Well, what does it exactly mean about becoming perfect? Uh, so two weeks ago, Jay spoke about the flesh. Sarks is the, the word that you're going to hear in a minute. Um, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That word is sarx in the Greek. Or consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. And then he goes off and lists impurity, and passion, impurity passions, evil desires, greed, which amounts to idolatry. So these are all the things of the flesh. This is the immorality that your flesh will lead you into. Now, if we pop back up to Philippians 1, it says also, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You remember I was going over this with you. What does that mean, to live is Christ? Well, you've been Christed, not munioned, right? But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor. So the flesh is something that we have to contend with. But it's not something that we hate. 
How can you hate yourself and then still say, I have the love of God in me? Does that sound familiar? John, right? John goes into the Apostle John talks about that at length. You can't hate yourself and say you have the love of God. But we bear the burden of this flesh. That's what Paul's getting at. We're bearing the burden of this flesh. It's a burden sometimes, right? I, I joke around in class sometimes. I'll say, you know, yeah, well, it's a burden being me, but how can I be this awesome? I don't know, you know. And, and I play with the, the students that way, but really it is. It's, it's, a, it's a slog sometimes, right? I, I did this thing with, I don't know, what happened but my back and I pinched a nerve and I got bursitis in my hip now and, and I got two toes that are permanently dislocated. I've had the surgery on this knee twice. I got three screws in this shoulder and four screws in this shoulder. Man, I am just messed up. Just the physical, right? Bearing under the burdens of just the physical can be a lot. And then you throw in the emotional and you throw in the spiritual battles. And it can be a lot. It can absolutely be a lot. And Paul acknowledges that. He says, this starts. By the way, that word is rooted, or is the root of the word sarcophagus. It's a coffin. We're walking around in coffins. <laughs> Crazy to think about, right? This is a coffin. That's how we're supposed to think about it. It's a shell. And there are things that we got to do. We got to drink enough water. If we don't drink enough water... You're, you're, you know, you're dragging. If you don't eat enough food, you're dragging. If you don't get enough sleep, you're dragging. Well, then there's caffeine, but I digress. <laughs> Teachers and caffeine, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a sarcophagus. We could actually insert that word there. You know, for me to live on in this sarcophagus is actually gain. Oh, and Paul's about to get us there. One thing first, oops, hold on. One thing first before we get there. There we go, sorry. Uh, Steve talked about faith. And as I was putting this all together and, and trying to do the teacher thing, remind you what we've, where we've been so we can get to where we're going. And, and so all these men and women are from Hebrews 12. These are the exemplars of faith from the Old Testament. Take a look at those names. That's quite a list. Some of them, that's quite a list. Samson? <laughs> really? I think I mentioned that to somebody a couple weeks ago. I can't remember who it was. And they said, Samson? Wasn't that Samson and Delilah Samson? I'm like, yeah. He's up there. <laughs> I remember this well because when I was 11 years old, I started going to a Church of Christ in Texas, and uh, I, we, we moved you know, a lot, and, and so I was there with my, my stepdad's mom, and uh, she said, oh, you need to get church in you, so I'm okay, and so I go, and, and probably within two, three weeks, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it, and kids from school, I'm starting to fit in, and, and then he brings up, the, the, the Bible study leader brings up um, the story of Samson, and how Samson is going to be judged. I had a little argument with him. I said, no, he's not. He's in the Hebrews Hall of Faith, man. I don't know how I knew that. I'd been reading somewhere, or maybe I just read what you know, was handed to me, and it showed in Hebrews Hall of Faith also. And, and we had this argument, and it ended with, Mr. Munyon, I don't think you're ready for this class yet. And so I didn't go anymore. I was done. Which led me, eight years later, to becoming a Christian. Um, but yeah, even Samson, flawed people. There's only two names on that list where they don't talk about some kind of flaw, by the way. All the rest, and it doesn't say they were flawless, the two that aren't. It's just, it's just a short story, right? Abel got killed by his brother, right? <laughs> Didn't say a whole lot because it was a short story. Uh, but every single one is flawed because they were all human. So faith and being a faithful person, a faithful witness of God, is not dependent on being perfect. And yet Paul goes on about it in chapter 3 of Philippians, being perfect. What's that all about? Well, these were all Sark's dwellers. Men and women who were stuck in a coffin. And they understood that they had this weakness in their flesh. 
but they also understood. Number one, don't mix the flesh with the holy God, Yahweh. Don't do it. If the holy God, Yahweh, comes to your door and knocks on it, you put that flesh aside. You don't eat, you don't drink, you don't sleep. Whatever in, you're engaged in that might be seemingly immoral, you put it aside and you follow. That's why Samson can be on that list. His defining act was following the last word of God. God said, go push the pillars down. All right, God. If this is how I redeem myself, if this is how I'm supposed to follow you, every single one of them had a story about carrying the flesh with them, but not letting it mix with the word. Number two, they acted on faith. They didn't question. Abraham, leave your family. Uh, okay. <laughs> right? You know? Um, let's see. We can go through here quickly. Isaac, right? Uh, Jacob, oh yeah. <laughs> right? All these names. Moses. Go back, Moses. What? Who is that? Go back. Lord? Okay. All right. I don't know how it's going to work out. They want to kill me, you know. Go back. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. All along the way. Going down that list. Every single one of them. They're Sark's dwellers carrying the coffin of their flesh. So now my job is to talk about perfection. <sighs> Thank you. It's a tough burden. Uh, so growing up, I, we moved 20 different times before I was a senior in high school, and I did learn some ways to feign perfection, look like I was perfect. Uh, I, I tried to always be the teacher's pet, be the know-it-all. I would ask for my seat to be in the front of the class because I knew that's where the bullies couldn't get me. <laughs> I also knew that I probably was a little behind because it usually takes a week or two to move and I was wanting to catch up, right? I needed to know the answers so that I could have a good grade in class that meant something to me. My stepdad, he was pretty abusive, so I learned to be very careful. By the time I was 11, I learned how to climb trees. Very useful. And I learned how to be very, very careful around him with my words. Be very careful. And by the time I was 14, I didn't see him very much. I learned different places like the track, right? Learned where to go, different sports, football practice. Oh, sorry, won't be home till six. Got a game tonight, right? So I avoided. I learned how to perfectly avoid him. And then bullies. I learned how to perfectly time, by the time I was 11 years old, perfectly time my words so that the bullies were in front of the girls. And one good shot, one right placed word would just see them shrivel up and disappear. And I rarely had trouble with bullies after the first couple of weeks. There was one time, but he was a racist, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, almost every time I did that, the bully would disappear for the rest of the three, four, five, six months that I was there at that school. Wouldn't see him again. Just a well-timed word to embarrass them in front of the ladies. Now, when I became a Christian, how do you be perfect for God? I didn't know. I'm like, this is kind of scary. This is God, the God of the universe. I understood that, right? I had a little bit of church in my background, so I kind of understood God can see everything, right? He's there all the time. His eyes go to and fro, waiting to catch you, waiting to, to zap you with lightning bolt, just like Zeus or something, right? Well, no, not exactly. That's not what he means. Then one of my mentors, within a, about a week or two, he said, Russ, you got a lot of questions. You got more questions than anybody I know or have ever known here. <laughs> he gave me a huge tome 
the Strong's exhaustive concordance. Yeah, imagine my uh, great joy when I found, I think it was about 94, maybe 95, I found one online. I'm like, now I know every word. I have the power. Yeah, down a rabbit hole, that's where it's at, right there. Uh, and one of my first studies was actually this example of teleo, teleiuu. I don't, I don't know Greek really, but I can look it up in Strong's Concordance. I did sleep at Holiday Inn last night. Um, so this perfection in Philippians is this word, and it doesn't mean what you think it means. It does not mean the perfect that we have come to think of. It says in one six. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's kind of a hint. Up in chapter 1, verse 6, he gives us a hint of what's coming. And then he launches into this long thing about examples, and he launches into faith and joy and salvation. Then third chapter, he brings it back around. And he says, let's talk about this perfect This word perfect means to make perfect. It doesn't mean to be flawless. It doesn't mean being that set of angles that cannot be varied. It doesn't mean that, okay, walk six steps forward from the old oak tree, then eight steps to the right, and then ten steps to the left, and then four steps forward and six steps to the left again, and then dig down 23 feet and you'll find the treasure chest. And if you're off by one foot, will you find the treasure chest? I was laughing last night uh, with uh, John, my son, our son, and uh, his his fiance. They were talking about uh, digging for gold, right? I I like, there's one one, uh, TV show on that I really like watching. It's... uh, The Curse of Oak Island, right? They've been going for nine years. Nine years digging for this gold. And they still haven't found it. And it's become a joke now to me, just to kind of turn it on and fast forward through everything. Nope, 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 get to the end. I can watch it like 20 minutes now. Yep, they didn't find it again. (laughs) Because they're one foot off every time, it seems like. They find hints but they're always a foot away. Well, that's not what God is asking us to do, not to be on the spot exactly. That's being flawless. It's also not a social score. It's not something that is deemed appropriate by your peers. (laughs) I never would have thought I was going to do this. When I was 16, 17 years old, I never thought I was going to be a Christian. I cursed God. I threw that cross as hard as I could when I broke my foot, said, there is no God. This lucky charm didn't work for me. He must not be real. Six months later, changed my tune. So it's not about how popular we are, how... Your place in society sets you up. Can God use you just because you're homeless? Yeah, God can use you because you're homeless. Can God use you because you're a king? Yeah, the Bible says that too. He uses everybody from every culture, from every strata of society. Not a single one he hasn't used yet. Doesn't matter how different you are. How munioned you are. It's also not a sacrifice. You can't go out and just buy three doves and, you know, give them to the, give them to the priest at the altar and say your ten Hail Marys and then go help, a, you know, a person across the street and then uh, cut your neighbor's lawn and, you know, shoveling their snow every day all winter. That'll get you out of perdition. No. It's not a sacrifice. It's all of these. (laughs) It's all Ten Commandments. Um, But it's also not, right? 
It's not a system. That's the key word there. It's not a system of do or don't. There's do's and there's don'ts, but it's not a system. So I can't look at you and say, all right, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to don't do this, don't do that, and then you're good. No. It's harder. It's harder than that. I have, I have a, a pretty good runner uh, that's really, really trying to, to set some, some personal records, and, uh, and he keeps asking, what else can I do? What else can I do? What else can I do? And I keep saying, trust the plan. <laughs> okay? Trust the plan. And he's getting faster and faster through the season, and he needs to trust the plan. He'll get faster. And I've told him many times, it's, it's not about an X number of miles. Well, if I run 90 miles this week, will it do it, coach? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't go run 90 miles. You're not training for a marathon. Relax. He's so eager. He could hurt himself. Same as us. If we get out in front of God, we can end up in... It's not just a system of do's and don'ts. It is the pursuit of relationship with and dependence on God. We have to pursue the relationship. We have to pursue, have to pursue the de dependence. It's not something you do once. Oh, I depended on God when I was 19. Turned out really well for me. Yeah. No, it has to be a pursuit. And then you also have to, through that pursuit, through that dependence on God, continue acting in faith. It's not just the pursuit of the relationship. Hey, I pursued God. Ah, I didn't find him. I depended on God. The last thing he told me was 33 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. Okay. <laughs> that was 33 years ago. God's doing a new work in your heart, right? Behold, every morning new, it says. So you have to continue in faith. God, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? I don't know how to do that, but okay. That's the next thing. Hebrews 13, verses 8 through 9. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not about eating food sacrificed to idols or not eating food sacrificed to idols. Paul went through that as well in Corinthians. These people of old, in chapter 12 of Hebrews... That's not how they got there. It wasn't about the food. David, famously, worked on a Sunday eating the food. Oops, the shoe bread. Yeah, darn. And Jesus turned that around on the Pharisees in a story and said, what you gonna do now? You claim to be children of David. You're children of a sinner. So 2 Chronicles, um, I looked up the word perfect in, uh, in the Old Testament to see what kind of examples we could find of perfect there. And I come across King Asa. This is an amazing story. We don't have a lot of time to just go through every single little bit, but so I pulled out the, the meat of it, 2 Chronicles 16, 7 through 9. Um, and so basically the northern kingdom, Israel, two tribes, Judah, uh, was the one that was supposed to be following heartily, just, just with all their heart, right? Following after the true Yahweh. And, and the northern kingdom went astray. And they're starting to attack Judah. And instead of stepping on in faith, Asa does something abominable. He takes gold from the treasury of Yahweh and pays one of the kings to go defend Israel one of the, the neighboring king, kingdoms. And God says through the prophet, so Hanani the seer came to ask Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you've relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. You're supposed to kill him, by the way. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because... You relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord, oops, 
There we go. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. That word completely is perfectly. Oh. See, the eyes of the Lord don't move to and fro to punish. Not exactly. I guess if you desire discipline, it's not punishment. If you don't desire discipline, then it is punishment. The eyes of the Lord also move to and, th- to and fro throughout the land to support those who are perfectly his, who are wholly committed, is another definition of that word. It's shalem. We'll get to that. It's this word, perfect. Now, he has a son. Asa does. Asa dies. Asa dies pretty horribly, by the way. And he refuses to ask God for the healing. That was another big, big no-no. Um, he, he went to doctors, and not the doctors were the problem, but he refused to ask God. And he, it says he only relied on the physicians. Oh. So then Asa's son comes along, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, he finishes. It's quite interesting. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's. Wait a minute, I thought his dad was Asa. His father David's earlier days and did not seek the, ba- the Baals, but sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. Wow. He picked a different dad. I didn't know you could do that. So King Asa was the great-great-grandson of David. He'd done well early on. He started good, right? Some of you have uh, run track, maybe, in your past, and, and the 400 meters, the one lap. You see this a lot, people, when they first start. We, we got a bunch of freshmen this year on the track team. And they go out, they're like, yeah! And the last 50 to 100 meters look like a really bad dance by Mr. Munyon. <laughs> Happens every year to those freshmen. We tell them, you can't charge out. You've got to save some for the end. You're going to feel horrible. Happens every year. That was Asa. Asa charged out. He's like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to return the temple to God. Tear down that, that, those altars inside the temple. We're going to command you. You shall love the Lord your God and worship him only in that temple. Meanwhile, he lives in a place where he's in full view of the asterisk poles on the hilltops. I don't know if you guys did anything about that, didn't know anything about asterisk poles. Human sacrifice. Yeah, he refused to go up and tear them down. He left them there. So he started well. Didn't finish strong. He ignored the high places of Baal. He gave gold to God's enemies for protection. And he refused to seek God. King Jehoshaphat, the great, great, great grandson, totally different story. He followed his father. David's example. He picked David over Asa to be his father. Some of you might remember part of my testimony. I didn't have much of a dad. Saw him three times, lived with him for a total of maybe a year. I learned somewhere along the way. I don't know where it was. I had a lot of good teachers. A lot of people of God, I'm sure, were in my life. Somewhere when I was a young child, seven, eight years old, that I could pick my father. I didn't have to follow my dad, my biological dad's example. I didn't have to follow my stepdad's example. Definitely didn't want to be him. I picked something from my grandpa. I picked something from my dad. I picked something from good men. I don't even know. 
along the way, I got this sarks, this coffin that I carry around that made me who I am as a man. Imperfect, but it's definitely not my dad, definitely not my stepdad, definitely not my grandpa. It's something I picked up from all the men in my life as I moved along to the age of 18, 19, even into my 20s. Some of the men I met taught me some amazing things. My father-in-law, he taught me how to, how to be generous. He was a very generous man. Like, man, I've never met anyone this generous in my life. And it wasn't a flamboyant thing. It wasn't like he'd come along and just drop a pile of money or anything. No, it was just like a, a natural thing. Like, hey, you need, you need this? Well, not really. Well, yeah, you do. Well, you know, I'm, I'm saving, and, and we'll get there. No, let me get that for you. What? Very generous. Pick things up along the way, even to this day. Still picking things up for men in this church. How to be a man. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. King Asa was not complete. He was not, here's this word shalem, blameless, complete, completed, completely entire. Look down at the bottom. Wholly devoted. Four times it's given that interpretation. Wholly devoted. I think we can apply that to King Asa. He was not wholly devoted. However, we can tell that about Jehoshaphat because his reign ended with God in charge of Judah. He was wholly devoted. You're an adopted child of Yahweh. You get to pick your, your dad. And you've chosen Yahweh. I hope I'll help you make that decision. You've chosen Yahweh. Is that the only father? Are you following the father Asa in some ways? Are you wholly devoted to Yahweh? Are you learning from the examples, those exemplars in front of you? And will you cut off the sarks? Will you ignore the sarcophagus that you're carrying? Well, you see, my, my dad beat me when I was a child. Okay, but what's God telling you to do today? He'll, he'll give you the power. He'll give you the ability. Yeah, well, you see, I, I got addicted to cigarettes. Man, I just, I got to have those cigarettes. Well, okay. But what is God telling you to do? Can you set it aside for one minute to step out in faith and go do it? God doesn't care about that, Sarks. Whatever sarcophagus you're carrying, doesn't matter to him. I mean, look at the Old Testament. Any one of those people he could have struck down. Heck, one time he used a donkey. I'm surprised the donkey isn't in Hebrews, <laughs> right? He used a donkey because the prophet wouldn't say the words that he wanted him to say. I was driving in the car, in the truck, um, about two, three weeks ago, thinking about uh, just my, my failures. I thought, God, how can you use me? I was overwhelmed. My sarks was getting to me. I'm like, oh, so hard. And God spoke to me and said, yeah, but nobody else is where I need them. You are exactly in the place I need you to be to do the things I need you to do. There's nobody else out on that track team at Douglas High School. There's nobody else at Rite of Passage in that classroom. There's nobody else on that bus talking to those kids. There's nobody else out on a trail talking to a stranger about Jesus. Going for a run. There's just nobody else. Now, that doesn't mean that you guys aren't there exactly. It means you aren't there physically, right? You're someplace else physically. You're someplace else perfectly. Oh, 
you are the perfect you for where God has you. That's what perfection is all about. Hebrews 6, 1 through 12, um, it talks about the elementary things. And in order for you to engage that perfect, you have to leave the elementary. That's what he was talking about. Paul was talking about with, yeah, you got your salvation. Awesome. I'm glad you got your salvation. I'm glad you're passing it on. I'm glad you're passionate about your salvation. Now let's go on. I'm going to show you some examples of some mature people, and I'm going to drop the perfection bomb on you. You got to be perfect. Not in the way you think, though. Not in the way of perfect behavior. We're talking about cutting off the flesh or leaving the elementary. If you leave the elementary, then all these things pass away. That's all you got to do is just recognize and seek. Remove the high places. The high places are these ideals, the wisdom, the wisdom of the day. Oh, you got to have a good 401k. Better put some money away. Unless God told you, I wouldn't do it. It's a good goal. It's a great goal to have whatever. Or maybe you have an awesome adventure. Yeah, I'm planning on this awesome adventure. I was talking to our oldest, Hannah, uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, she challenged me. Like, don't challenge me. Like, yeah, I'd like to see you at the London Marathon in a few years. Really? I don't know, that would be an awesome adventure. But it's not up to me. It's up to God. Am I going to try for it? Yeah, as long as the faith is there on both sides, right? I'm going to step out in faith, and if God doesn't support me, I'm going to have to reevaluate. Is this awesome adventure about God or about me? See? Yeah, going to Hawaii, awesome adventure. If it's about God, or if God is saying, do it, awesome, go for it. Make sure that awesome adventure is of God. Not you. It shouldn't come from your sarks. I always want to go, why? It's kind of fun thinking about it. I don't know if I'll be there or not, but I don't know. We'll see. Awesome adventure. But not if it comes the expense of the Spirit. You are the perfect version of Christ. You are it. You're the exemplar. You're there in that car. You're in that job. You're in that school. You're in that store. You're in that team moment around any table, anywhere, you are that perfect version of Christ. Don't think you don't have it. You have it. All you got to do is say, God, what do I say? God, what do I do? How do I figure this out? If you ask him, he will give you the perfect words or actions to change the course. You could change the course of history for somebody just by sharing Christ into their life. I'm a perfect example. I was headed down a bad road. Don't know if I was going to be psychotic or not, but hey, anything was possible at that point. I know what I turned out because God was shared with me, and it's much better than what I was. Matthew 7, 7, ask and keep on asking. I love this version, the amplified version, because it, it truly encapsulates what it means, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. That's the true tense of those verbs, ask, seek, and knock there. It's not just ask once, because if you remember, he followed it up with a story about somebody who knocked on a judge's door, and the judge said, even though he was an unrighteous judge, he said, go away at first, even though he was a righteous judge, the more they knocked, the more he was led to open the door and say, okay, fine, what? Even though he was an unrighteous judge. And we have the most righteous judge, God, as our father and judge. So I stole this slide from uh, Jay. Good teachers are good thieves. 
I thought it was a perfect way to end again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the blessing to go with. You are the perfect exemplar. Not gulp, but yes, I can do this. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking through me. Thank you for helping me keep my sarks out of the way, the sarcophagus, this coffin. Lord, thank you for blessing each one of us in the place that we're at so that we have influence around us. Help us to influence those even more. Help us to see the need, plan for those needs, and fulfill those needs as people come to us. Help us to stop and ask you for the words when we feel the Spirit itching at our ears, saying, listen to me. Give us more and more of your Spirit, Lord, so as we go out of here, you fulfill the Great Commission through us. Let us be your hands and your feet and your eyes and your ears and your mouth. Lead us in your power of your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.